श्री किरण रिजिजू जी यूनियन लॉ मिनिस्टर माय डिस्टिंग्विश्ड कलीग्स श्री जस्टिस एम एम सुंदरेश जस्टिस पी एस नरसिम्हा चीफ जस्टिस ऑफ द दिल्ली हाई कोर्ट जस्टिस सतीश शर्मा जस्टिस राजेंद्र मैनन द चेयरपर्सन ऑफ द आर्म फोर्सेस ट्राइब्यूनल I will, of course, take his name also. Shri R. Venkatramani, the learned Attorney General, who was very gracious to come and participate in this function. Shri Manan Kumar Mishra ji, Chairperson of the Bar Council of India. Shri Apurva Kumar Sharma, Shri S. Prabhakaran, all the distinguished senior members of the Bar Council of India, and of all the state bar councils, the High Court Bar Associations, who have graced this occasion. Senior Member of Parliament, Mr. P. Wilson. All the members of the family who are here, particularly my very respected mother-in-law, my very gracious wife, my sister, brother-in-law, friends, my sisters-in-law who have come, travelled far and wide from Canada and Bangalore. <laughs> very dear friend, friends Rebecca and Annie who are also travelling to be here, and friends. I must express my gratitude to all the members of the bar for having organized this beautiful function and wearing all these turbans with multi multi hues different colors different embroidery different tapestry different texture the texture of the scarves the colors of the scarves the colors of the paintings which were presented to me really symbolizes the vast diversity of the country it reflects what we are as a people but above all it reminds us that through all these beautiful colors which define our clothes our festivals our religions our ways of thinking we are yet one nation and we are welded together we are welded together as one nation years and years ago when the constitution was drafted it was a thought was expressed in the constituent assembly how can a nation as diverse stay together and over seven decades since independence after 75 years we have demonstrated to the world that the reason why we are so tightly knit together in a bond of citizenship in a bond of nationhood is because we deeply understand and respect each other our humanity and what better place to respect than the members of the bar your chairperson is manan kumar mishra ji मनन को हम चिंतन भी कहलाते हैं तो आज समय ऐसा है कि थोड़ा सा कुछ हम मनन चिंतन भी करें अपने इस व्यवसाय पे ऑन दिस इंस्टीट्यूशन ऑफ विच वी आर प्राउड मेंबर्स आई बीन मोस्ट ऑनर्ड टू बी कंपेयर्ड विद द यूथफुल लुक्स ऑफ द डिस्टिंग्विश लॉ मिनिस्टर I can only say that he is genuinely young. I am only an imposter. <laughs> while doing a quick Google, uh, while doing a quick Google, uh, Google search, a short while ago, I realized that I was twelve years and eight days old when the law minister was born. <laughs> so that would justify my saying that i am really an imposter <laughs> he is genuinely he belongs to the category of the young <clears throat> my early years in the legal profession were years of learning of imbibing of sharing of sharing small luxuries so small pleasures like the bar canteen where we would dis we would discuss law we would discuss all the social issues of the day and we would think that the weight of the nation was on our shoulders and we believed that we had ideas to every social evil which plagues our society 
On one wintry morning in the law school, I was a student of the campus law center here in Delhi. One of my friends walked up to me over a cup of tea and said in Hindi, Ab tu karega kya? What will you do in life? So I said, I will do exactly what all of us are here to do, which is to study law and become lawyers. But then he said, but zindagi kaise guzarega? How will you make your livelihood? So I said, I was a little nonplussed and I said that, well, by practicing law. But then he said that, Dekh, main aapko kuch sachai sunana chahta hoon. Ki is profession mein aapko jina hai, to aur kuch bhi thoda sa apna le. To maine kaha, to kya apna le? What should I do? So he says, why don't you get a gas agency or a retail oil dealership? <laughs> So you can tell the world that you are a lawyer, but you will have sufficient means to sustain yourselves. <laughs> and I said to myself, that thought has never left me. Because in so many ways, it reflects the truth about our profession. That while you have at the tip of the profession, top-notch lawyers in the Supreme Court who would have, say, seven or eight screens opened before them when the video conferencing hearings were going on so that they could flip from court to court at the flip, flip of a mouse. Yet you have lawyers, when the court was shut and the registrar's court was not functioning during the COVID times, they were virtually living from hand to mouth. One of the first things that the Supreme Court Bar Association president told us was, sir, when you reopen the court, please get the registrar's court going. Now, the registrar's court deals with very small procedural issues, substitution of legal heirs, placing a matter before the chamber court, all the small things for which juniors run to that court. But he said that is what sustains the junior's life and livelihood because that's when a junior will get 800,000 rupees to appear and at the end of the month be able to sustain a family. For the longest period when I was a member of the Mumbai Bar, Space was very difficult to get. So I had an office all of 180 square feet. But the beauty of my office is that you just crossed over from the high court into my office. But it was all of 180 square feet, which was sufficient to sustain the kitchen, the home, the hearth and the family. As a young law student, when we went to the campus law center, we would take the DTC bus, I still remember the bus route numbers, which was 210, 220 or 240. It took the ring road. If you, if it was very crowded, you took a 101, which went to Regal and which went through Old Delhi. It took a longer time. And again, as young students of law, we would use those conversations in these buses to talk about law, to talk about what we are reading, or just plain friendship and camaraderie. And that sense of friendship and camaraderie is what sustains our profession. All of us in the profession, and I say when I say all of us, I don't mean the judges because we, by training, we do not have a political ideology. We decide cases on the basis of the law. But all of us as lawyers, we have our own ideologies, we have our own predilections, we have our own social backgrounds, but the beauty of the legal profession is that when we wear that black coat, a white shirt and black trouser and wear that gown over us, it kind of masks everything that lies underneath. And it is a reminder to us that irrespective of what we profess or believe, we are all involved in one common mission, which is the mission to do justice to common citizens. I did my BA in Economics Honours from St. Stephen's College, an elite institution of the university of which I am deeply proud even today. Some of the finest minds in the country which are laying down policy even today were batchmates of mine and I look up to them even now. But that journey from St. Stephen's College to the Campus Law Centre was a journey of a different universe. Because when we became students of law, you had students from all different backgrounds. 
not students who are necessarily academically the brightest students in the nation, but students who had an earthy understanding of life, farmers' children, children who, who would be the first generation of lawyers in their families, who taught us about the reality of India and from whom we learned the reality of India. An independent bar is inextricably linked with the independence of the judiciary. The reason for that is that as judges, we have no personal defense or a platform to defend ourselves. I always welcome critics of judgments and naturally so because the areas of law which we write on, particularly as judges of superior courts like the high courts and now the Supreme Court, many of these areas of law do not speak of one solution. Even when we deliver a judgment or write something, you go back and ask yourself, is this the best solution which I have found? You would be a hypocrite if you didn't question yourself. So because we write on areas which are so complex, socially complex, there are bound to be differences of opinion and any critique of the court is welcome. But ultimately, our real defense to our own independence as judges comes from the bar. And it is a bar which has, the bar has stood up for what is right in the judiciary. I was part of a bar which passed a resolution against four judges of the Bombay High Court whom we felt were not exactly true to their oath of loyalty to the constitution, to do their duties without fear or favor, affection or ill will. And we passed a resolution that we will cease to appear before those judges. But that same bar has stood for the independence of judges when they have been wronged. So we are in that sense, when we are members of the bar, we are the conscience keepers of the nation's judiciary, conscience keepers of the quest for justice to common citizens. The district judiciary, whom so many of you represent as bar councillors, is the first point of interface with our common citizens. When a common citizen has a problem, say an arrest or a threat of arrest, the first point of contact is that when you apply under section 438 before the court of competent jurisdiction in the district judiciary and seek anticipatory bail, at the stage of remand, that is the point where the citizen has the first interface with the system of administering justice in our country, not with the high courts, not with the Supreme Court, but with the district judiciary. Our district judiciary is really confronted with a paucity of infrastructure. The central government has a large number of schemes, but the monies which are meant for the district judiciary have to devolve on the district judiciary for improving the infrastructure. Just the other day when the Supreme Court Bar Association felicitated me, I pointed out the reality of the district judiciary as it functions. I pointed out that when I was the administrative judge of the district of Kolhapur in Maharashtra, there was no toilet for women judges. And the women judges told us as administrative judges that we go to work at 8.30 in the morning and our first in the interface with the toilet is at 6 o'clock in the evening when we return home. We feel extremely awkward to go to the public toilet for women because we have to cross the under trials who are sitting just outside the toilet and I'm then sitting in the court. Just the other day I read a report about the fact that there was no toilet for women in Hathras. Now this is not just a problem of funds, it's also a question of commitment of us to ensure that funds which are made available are truly employed for the purpose for which they are intended. But yet our district judiciary soldiers on, as we saw our district judiciary soldiered on during the times of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our lawyers suffered very grave distress during the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. Just as society suffered distress. Yet our bar associations tried to keep the flag burning, the, the, the light, the torchlight burning and the flag fire flying high by providing for assistance to lawyers. So this was a great mission which 
the bar council of india or high court bar associations the district bar associations did to protect young lawyers middle aged lawyers who live from month to month who have no resources to fall back upon if there is a point of distress much has to be still done for improving the service conditions of our district judiciary but above all we have to bring to our judici district judiciary a sense of dignity a sense of self worth a sense of confidence in their own respectability which is why i always say that our district judiciary is not a subordinate judiciary it is really the district judiciary which is equally important in the affairs of the nation's judiciary as of the high court or the supreme court the supreme court may lay down these big ticket judgments as they called important issues which are decided by the supreme court but the district judiciary in those small cases they define the peace the happiness tranquility and faith of common citizens the way we look at the district judiciary affects deeply our own personal liberty as citizens if district judges do not have the confidence in their own abilities in their own respect in the hierarchical system how would you expect a district judge to grant bail in an important case it is very easy to have a general mantra in a criminal case the offense is a heinous offense therefore there shall be no bail this is an offense involving murder this is an offense involving rape so there shall be no bail but we know as judges and you know as lawyers that even within that category of cases where the offense is heinous there may be a tendency to rope in somebody who is not exactly guilty we also know that sometimes informants tend to over exaggerate a first information report now how do you sift those who may be guilty from those who may possibly not be guilty that is the art of the district judge himself and that is what the lawyers have to point out to the district judiciary and it is when we do this common mission the higher courts are getting flooded with bail applications i have just taken a decision as chief justice of india that there are 2000 bail applications pending in the supreme court 3000 transfer petitions pending in the supreme court 5000 out of the total pendency so we decided at the full court meeting the other day that all benches of the supreme court will tell take 10 bail applications every single day the idea being that we have 13 benches today so 130 bail applications will be disposed of 650 at the end of one week hopefully at the end of four weeks we would have of course there will be fresh bail applications but this turnover has to constantly be maintained of matters which are filed and matters which are which are disposed of but the reason why the higher judiciary is getting flooded with bail applications is because of the reluctance of the grassroots to grant bail and why are judges at the grassroots reluctant to grant bail not because they don't have the ability not because the judges at the grassroots don't understand the crime they probably understand the crime better than many of the higher court judges because they know what crime is at the grassroots in the districts but there is a sense of fear that if i grant bail will somebody target me tomorrow on the ground that i granted bail in a heinous case this this sense of fear nobody talks about but which we must confront because unless we do that we are going to render our district courts toothless and our higher courts dysfunctional one of your members from varanasi just gave me a very beautiful statement written in hindi this evening that why is the high court of judicature dalabad flooded with bail applications should these applications not be considered by the district judiciary but the reason for it is the culture of distrust which we have generated amongst ourselves why should we distrust any person who grants relief to a citizen if you commit an error surely that error is amenable to correction and it's not that we in the supreme court never commit errors as they always say the supreme court is not final because it is right but it is right 
because it is final. So, the process of dispensing justice is so intrinsically human that we have to learn to trust our district judiciary. Because it is when we learn to trust our district judiciary that we will truly answer the needs of our common citizens who seek access to justice. As chairperson of the E-Committee, I've been greatly benefited by the collaboration with the Department of Justice, which the law minister oversees as both minister for law and the justice wings. Now, there is a technological divide in our country, which Manan Kumarji referred to a short while ago. But when we employ technology, let me make it very clear that the purpose is not to exclude. The purpose is to include lawyers, to include citizens. Technology cannot ever be exclusionary in its ambit. The idea is to make life more transparent, more efficient for young members of the bar. Let me give you an example. If a young lawyer today wants to access Supreme Court judgments or High Court judgments, you have to pay a hefty fee to purchase a software by one of the top software providers. One of the things which I felt was, is there no way for us to provide these judgments free of cost to young lawyers? <laughs> of course, all of you, as many of you are distinguished seniors of the bar, and you are most welcome as I, I am provided a very fine software by the, by the funds of the, uh, of the Union of India as a judge, because you require this, these funds for uh, proper software for our judges. But look at the plight of a young lawyer before a civil judge junior division in a taluga court. We today on the national judicial data grid, we have 77 lakh high court judgments which have already been uploaded. Now, if all these 77 now, I've constituted a committee of three judges of the high court, Justice Rajiv Shakdar of the Delhi high court, Justice Raja Vijay Raghavan of the, uh, of the Kerala high court, and Justice Suraj Govindraj of the or Karnataka High Court, to bring out uniform neutral citations. And I am expecting that the report will be delivered to us very shortly, so that all these judgments which are now loaded on the NJDG can be cited in a court of law. So this will be an enormous benefit to young lawyers who can access these judgments. If we, if we do not allow, if we do not provide the means for young lawyers to access judgments, to read judgments, how will they learn the law? And if they have to pay a hefty fee to even get judgments of the Supreme Court or the High Courts, how will they have access to the law? So we must create by the use of technology conditions. One of the missions of the E-Committee is to train human resources. So we have master trainers at the state level, master trainers at the district level, master trainers at the taluka level across India. And the idea is to train our lawyers on the use of technology. Third, we must not expect young lawyers, senior lawyers, middle-level lawyers, or our citizens to reach out to courts. The courts must reach out to them. So as part of the phase three of our e-courts project, we are setting up e-seva kendras in every court establishment, even in the Supreme Court. When we want matters to be filed through e-filing, as so many of your bar counselors have told me, Lawyers don't have laptops. Young lawyers may not have desktops. But why should the court system exclude them? So we propose to set up, and we are in the process of setting up e-seva kendras across India in every court establishment where all these services will be available. Under the Di Digital India Mission of the Union Government, the central, the CSEs, the service corporations, are going to provide e-services e at the level of every Gram Panchayat. We have fused our e-court services with the CSE centers so that down to the level of each Gram Panchayat, these facilities of courts, whether it is in terms of knowledge about the next date of hearing, judicial orders, various other services can be provided to all our citizens. Let me briefly deal with one or two other issues which are very close to my heart before I conclude. It's been a long evening for all of you as well, which is the issue of legal education. 
Very often we are asked as judges, why don't we have more women in the high courts? Why don't we have more women in the Supreme Court? Why is there no woman judge in the Patna High Court? Now, one thing which we need to understand is that the face of the legal profession today or the face of the judicial institutions today, the face of the Supreme Court today, the face of the high courts today, reflects the state of the legal profession 30 years ago and the case of the Supreme Court 40 years ago. I joined the legal profession in 1982. That's roughly the time when most of my colleagues joined the legal profession, give or take a few, few years. So who enters the Supreme Court today is largely defined by what was the state of the legal profession when we all joined the profession 40 years ago in the high courts is 30 years. In the Supreme Court, typically we would have put in 10 years extra before we come here. In my case, it was 16 years before I came to the Supreme Court. Now, what happens as a result is that if we do not create an equal opportunity legal profession today, these problems which confront the marginalized communities, not just women, but marginalized communities, will continue to fester in our legal profession decades down the line. So if we have to improve the state of access to opportunities to hire judicial officers, we have to change the face of the legal profession today in terms of who enters the legal profession. And the responsibility for that is not just of the government or the higher judiciary. The responsibility for that is of all of you as citizens, as lawyers. In our profession, is it not very commonplace that juniors find seniors on the basis of an informal network? Some will call it an old boys club. But at least there are networks. We do not have a merit-based method of selecting young lawyers who will be recruited to chambers. How many seniors pay their juniors decent salaries? If you are staying in Delhi or Mumbai or Bangalore or Calcutta, how much does it cost for a young lawyer to survive? Even in a place like Allahabad, if a young lawyer is coming in from the districts, you have to find place to stay, you have to find place to pay, uh, some rent to pay, transportation, food. Our young lawyers do not have even chambers where they are paid money. That must change. And the burden of doing that is on us as senior members of the profession. But too long we regard the youngsters in our profession as slave workers. Why? Because that's how we grew up. We can't now tell the young lawyers today that that's how we grew up. You know, this was the old ragging principle in Delhi University. <laughs> those who were ragged always ragged those people who are below them. Because it was you're passing on the blessings of being ragged, you see. <laughs> Sometimes it got very bad. But the point is that seniors today cannot say that, well, that's how I learned the law in the hard way. And therefore, I will now not pay my juniors. Those times were very different. Families were smaller, there was family resources, and so many young lawyers who could have made it to the top never made it for the simple reason that they had no resources. So this structure of the legal profession, which is so patriarchal, sometimes so caste-based, has to change so that we as lawyers discharge our duties to our society to make the legal profession open up to our people from different communities, from the marginalized groups in our society. On the infrastructure of the district judiciary, next week we are holding the celebrations for the Constitution Day on the 26th of November. The Honorable Prime Minister has agreed to inaugurate the Constitution Day celebrations and the President of India will be delivering the valedictory address. All the Chief Justices of the High Courts are coming to the Supreme Court where we are going to discuss issues of infrastructure technology, appointments, everything that needs to be done in the Indian judiciary. <laughs> Beginning with the district judiciary. I'm very happy that the Bar Council of India is setting up a new university, the new international university at Goa. The National Law School of India University, which was set up in Bangalore, has become now 
a front runner for change. When I was a young lawyer, people first went to medicine, then they went to engineering, then they went to architecture, whatever. If you had nothing else to do, you also went into the law. <laughs> but which is not to say that the best did not get into the law. The best did get into the law. Because it's just that you probably didn't have the mind enough to be a doctor or an engineer. Now the best are coming into the legal profession. The Bar Council of India has a very large role and credit for that by setting up the NLSIU at Bangalore under the auspices of Professor Madhav Menon. And then the movement spread. You now have national law schools all over the country. Some of them are surviving well, some of them are only national in name. But you have excellent national law schools, including those at Kolkata, Delhi, Hyderabad, in, in Jodhpur. <coughs> so, <coughs> the national law school movement has given rise to serious lawyers in the profession. Many of them are now joining the district judiciary. And we need to tap this talent so that the young lawyers who are being turned out from the national law schools at the end of five years of study, they become judges in the district judiciary and eventually they will move up into the higher echelons. The recent recruitment in Rajasthan to the district judiciary gave rise to a situation where over 60% of the women who are, of the people who are recruited were women. That's a clear sign of the changing times. Just as women's education is now catching up, more and more women are not joining just the armed forces, thanks to the judgment of the Supreme Court, but they are now entering the portals of our profession and they will become distinguished lawyers of tomorrow. But my concern is that the optimism, the sense of hope, the sense of being proud citizens of this nation, this should not desert our young people when they actually enter the legal profession, when they come face to face with the reality of the legal profession. In the law schools, they'll read about all our constitutional jurisprudence. They'll read about you know, some of the best cases on criminal jurisprudence, whether it is Gurbak Singh Sibiya or Machi's case, or you know, uh, just name it and you'll, ha you'll have them uh, be, be so conversant with those cases which define personal liberty for our citizens. But when they come into the court, and they have their first interface with court, that sense of optimism should not give way to cynicism. And I think the burden is on all of us in whatever capacity we are, whether as administrators of the bar, as judges of the High Court and the Supreme Court, to keep the sense of optimism alive. And therefore, I always, when I have a young lawyer who appears before me, I will always spend a little more time. I know that there is a pile of arrears waiting for us to dispose of as judges of the Supreme Court. But at the end of the day, I feel that, well, for all the work that we do, these arrears are not going to go away overnight. But then if I spend 10 more minutes with a young lawyer and give them a little guidance on how to argue a case, something good has happened for the institution of justice in our nation. So I will request all of you, so, so many of you are senior members of the profession, to do your own bit. Spend a little more time with your juniors. Give them better access to education. And the level of talent is so enormous. Last year I had one slot for a law clerk. There were 650 applications for that one slot of a law clerk in the chambers. It just shows you the quality of the talent which is there in our country. Now the question is about not generating the talent, but how do you utilize the talent in this task of nation building? By creating appropriate conditions for them to work and to survive. Finally, as I conclude, let me just say that I hope that my tenure as Chief Justice would be marked by a sense of harmony and balance. One thing which I, I think what I learned, and I've been asked this repeatedly in the last few weeks, the press wants to get some sound bites out of you. I don't think I provided adequate sound bites. <laughs> But one thing which I have always learned from the elders with whom I associated, not just within the family, but outside as well, elders who I even now respect, is that what defines a good life is a sense of harmony and balance, to eschew positions which will destroy stability, harmony, and balance. Because harmony and balance is crucial to maintaining the 
tranquility of our society. And courts as institutions of governance in the country have a very important role to define that sense of harmony and balance. I did that as Chief Justice of the Allahabad High Court when I moved from Mumbai. It was a very different learning experience. Mumbai was a commercial city, high value matters. You opened a tax case and it was 5,000 crores. And you didn't bat an eyelid and you looked only at the legal principle. We were trained to do that as company court judges, as tax judges, as commercial court judges. When I went to the Allahabad High Court, I realized that you were dealing with issues of primary teachers. Teachers who feel that, well, I've crossed the age bar, but I need that six months relaxation so that I can be a good teacher. On harmony and balance, just one last word and I'm done. <laughs> Dr. Ambedkar, when he spoke to the Constituent Assembly on the eve of the adoption of the Constitution, said that Satyagraha strike this was an instrument when we were under colonial rule. He said that we, have now make, we are now making the migration to home rule. We are ruling ourselves. So Satyagraha strike, which was very relevant to the times of the colonial rule, must give way to cooperation, stability, tranquility, and balance. And that's the tranquility, balance, and social stability that I speak about. So as members of the bar, I would appeal to you I was Chief Justice for three years in Allahabad. We had a couple of strikes. But I would always call upon our lawyers and say, come on, talk to me. What's the problem that you are facing? Why this feeling that we strike against each other? Because when lawyers strike, you don't strike. Who, who suffers? The consumer of justice for whom we exist suffers. Not the judges, not the lawyers. Possibly the lawyers, because you know, after a few days, the fees stop, uh, start drying up. <laughs> but the greatest sufferer is the consumer, the person for whom justice is meant. So I think so much of what confronts us in terms of our problems, in terms of our pendency, can be resolved by dialogue, by understanding. And I think it's important for the members of the bar to also realize that so very often, when we take decisions in an administrative capacity in the Supreme Court, we are looking at things in a, in a national perspective. Lawyers, say, come, coming from the district judiciary, and I don't blame them, we look at it from their district judiciary perspective. Members of the bar from a high court will look at it from the perspective of that particular high court. I always tell colleagues from the high court, now that I interact with them so often, that the Supreme Court does not reverse a high court because you are wrong. But sometimes you feel that the view which you are taking is a better view from a national perspective, from the development of a national scheme of judicial precedent. Not because the high court was necessarily wrong. Because there are always two shades to a legal issue, as we know, or, or a social issue. So you must always trust. We must also learn to trust. Of course, question those in authority. But we must always learn to trust those in authority to a certain extent at least, that they have the best welfare of the institution at heart. Sometimes, if you have the best welfare of the institution at heart, you have to take some tough decisions. But if we didn't take those decisions, it would be so easy to say, well, I'll, do, I'll have a nice time until, my, until the constitution tells me to retire. Well, everybody, if we all did that, how would the country be a better place after a few years? So our mission is just the same. I must thank you with the bottom of, from the bottom of my heart for the beautiful reception, the beautiful function. Uh, usually I've been here when other chief justices, my predecessors, have been felicitated. And I would sit back and I would chuckle at you know, these <laughs> large bouquets being handed over. Now I was, it was my turn today to receive all of them. But I realized that you know, each bouquet, each of those scarves, each of those turbans carries the weight of the expectations of the nation. So, I sometimes, I'm sometimes worried about the weight of the expectations because after all, I'm only a human being. <laughs> and all your earnest desires and efforts are subject to so much, which the environment in which we live also affects and, and produces in terms of consequences. But we'll try our best, and I'm sure that you'll at least have one assurance from me that everything that I do would be in the interests of preserving the institution of justice so that it continues to have the faith of our common citizens. Thank you.